magical learner. All right, there you all are. And now I can share my screen. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, I, you know, you can't see me right now, but I'll show you my face in just a moment. I, we are going to talk about hips today, but I wanted to, we got into some sort of discussion. We're talking about scoliosis and we're talking about the chain of the body. And um, I mentioned the sling even under the bottom of the foot last week. And I felt like I did a very poor job and I was confusing myself. And so I wanted to just show you that sling under the foot because I think it's so cool and just sort of clarify that from last week. So I'm going to share my screen here, and that way, wait, how do I do that now? Where did my share screen go? <laughs> oh, here we go. Share my screen, and then I can show you this um, cool thing here. All right, so let me just move you guys. So the two muscles that create the sling under the bottom of the foot are the peroneus longus or fibularis longus and the um, tibialis anterior. And so I loved this little, this is just from Wikipedia, but they had this little rotating person, well, rotating skeleton here. And you can see how it goes from the side of the leg, actually crosses to that medial cuneiform and the metatarsal, first metatarsal. So you see how that outer muscle crosses all the way across under the foot, which I think is super cool. Of course I do. Um, and then the other muscle would be tibialis anterior, and I couldn't find such a cool diagram as that. But there was one here. Oh, I think I put you guys on top of it. Hold on. Yeah, where you can see the bottom of the foot here. And you can see where it goes from here around into the foot. Oh, and helps with ankle dorsiflexion. Where is that picture? Sorry. That's not what I want. I want tibialis posterior. Here we go. Um, right here. Where is it? There it is. There we go. So you can see it comes from the side of the foot and goes underneath, and it actually crosses underneath a little bit as well. So those two muscles, now I'll show you me, um, come together underneath the foot, and they make this sort of a sling right under here. Um, and so we have that sling continuing up the body. And that's what I wanted to share with you from last week. Before we go to squaring your hips, is that what it is, Allegra? <laughs> All right, let me stop share. Uh-oh, how do I get out to sharing now? Oh, there, right there. Okay, there we are. All right, that's what I wanted to share before we got started. So, um, hips. Today I thought we would talk about hips. Uh, the reason I actually picked hips is because that is the module that we are on now in our rehab course. And um, I just thought it was, there was a lot of good questions that came out of that course uh, on yesterday's when we launched that module. Um, a lot of questioning about how do you know um, what to do with somebody who has a hip injury? How do you know if pain at the hip is coming from like osteo, we were talking about osteoarthritis more specifically, if it's coming from osteoarthritis. Um, and then I mentioned also in that class that there's a fine line between not enough movement and too much movement. So if we talk, uh, and, and then I thought osteoarthritis is so widespread, and I'm sure you guys all have clients who have either pre-hip replacement or post-hip replacement. If you deal with anybody um, over 60, you'll have a population, there's quite a few people who have had hip replacements. So, or who are trending in that direction. And the question is when, uh, what is that line between not enough movement to keep their hip lubricated and too much movement where you're actually gonna annoy and irritate their joints? So that's what I thought I'd throw at you guys um, and just give you a little bit of a background and then I can, you guys can have questions or we can talk through some exercises, whichever you like best. So uh, at, for osteoarthritis more specifically, I feel like clients need to be moving. And with any arthritis, 
they need to keep moving to stay moving, right? If they get really, they get stiff. These are people who feel stiff in the morning. It's hard to get going. But then once they get going, they're feeling quite a bit better throughout the day. And it sort of repeats every day. Our goal for people with arthritis, we can do, what we can do for them is help them strengthen their muscles to support their joints. Help them understand that they need to attain a healthy body weight because that will also put the right amount of load on the hip, not too much load on the hip. Um, and then help them understand that getting move, movement is really the key to keeping those joints as lubricated as possible, but that too much movement is gonna grind the joint and make it really sore. So finding that right amount of movement is the key. So for us, I spend a lot of time with these people working on strength, working on stability, and then working on mobility as well, or lubrication of the joint. Our goal is no longer to have them doing you know, center splits or anything like that. Our goal is to get them to be able to walk so that they can be healthy and maintain that weight. Because they end up in this cycle of, it hurts when I walk, so I don't walk so much, so I gain weight, so I put more pressure on the joint, but then I can't walk because I hurt, so they end up in this cycle. Um, and so that is what I thought we could share about today. Do you guys have any specific questions about HIP that you'd like to address? I was just curious, since talking about the HIPs, and um, I get a lot when I'm doing the hip circles on the roller. Um, you know, people, sometimes they feel like there's like the clicks or the pops in the hip. And so I say, okay, decrease the range of motion. But I always wonder like, is that maybe bad for the hips or is it just like a form of like tightness? That's a very good question. So I believe, and I don't know that anybody knows exactly why the popping happens, but I believe it's muscle tightness, and I believe it's something muscle passing over something else. So a lot of times, if you change the angle of the leg, so a lot of times it happens for people when they're going into any sort of extension, even. So some people, it'll just happen if they go out on one side and not the other side. Sometimes it's just the way, the, where their tendons are running, or maybe they're just really tight as well. But if you just turn the knee out a little, or sometimes in a little bit, you could find that avoiding that line. You can also, sometimes also, encouraging them to really pull in the stomach uh, and work that more than the hip, they won't get the popping, or maybe not have them go out as far. And then what Allegra was talking about is kind of these hip circles. If they're popping over one spot, I would probably try and have them move in a way that does not have that happen. Sometimes I feel like they're just not stable and so they're getting too much movement. So trying to control the motion into a smaller range is, is a good approach. Uh, also, again, checking the angle of the hip could help also free up the muscle that's getting impinged or something as they're going around. Also, sometimes stretching out the muscles beforehand. If, it's, if you suspect tight muscle and you're in a private session, having them stretch the hip out before sometimes really helps alleviate that as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question though. I had one, I took one course from a woman named Suzanne Martin and in that course, she talked about she was talking about more about the pelvis, and somebody asked that hip clicking question, and she had a way to unwind it, but I didn't really understand how it it worked. Um, but she had people working in straddle, kind of rolling the hip in and out, um, and sliding it up and down to try and change the alignment. I think of that hip in the socket to try and make the pinch go away. Um, so you might try just stretching over the roller. If you're in, on the roller already, the psoas stretch, the adductor stretch, those are all good ways to, to stretch and then try again. And then also control that motion, make sure their pelvis is really stable. I think in those single leg circles, people get really unstable. Zaina, is it ever um, a case where it's actually the shape of the femur, like? the head of the femur and how it fits into the socket that's causing that 
because I, I've been told that. I know I have clicking on one side and I don't have in the other. And if I go to external rotation, like for leg lowers, for example, um, that I can avoid the clicking. But as soon as I go back to parallel, um, then the clicking starts again. So I didn't know if maybe it was more about the joint itself. Um, yeah, I, I haven't heard and I ha honestly haven't done a lot of research on it to know. But um, that's an interesting idea. The other thing, I mean, I think there's a number of things that could cause clicking. I think if your psoas gets super tight, it can cause some clicking. I think also the labrum, if it's uh, having difficulty, can potentially cause a popping or clicking as the leg goes down. So I think maybe that's more towards the joint. But I haven't heard necessarily that the shape of the joint does it, but I haven't looked it up to know exactly. Yeah, but that is a really good question and definitely worth looking up. So maybe I'll look it up for next time and see if I find anything. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other ideas? Yes. There we go. Um, I was just going to say, I just had a session with Zaina and when I was talking with you about um, the my hip issues, and um, how sometimes activating the psoas helps me with that because when when I start to feel when I start to notice that I get any kind of front of hip pain or the clicking starts for me, um, that's when I know it's that tight psoas, but it's also potentially weak. And sometimes activating um, against some sort of resistance and a short range of motion that doesn't pull the click in, um, you know, it avoids the click, um, I find sometimes can help work out of that, that point where you, it lets you have that range of motion again without the click. I don't know if that's for everybody, but that's something that I've noticed myself. Yeah. Do you want to show, you want me to show, I'll show it so you don't have to do it, but <laughs> What Genevieve was doing is just having her, um, just bringing her leg up against resistance or with the TheraBand over there and pulling upward. Right, Genevieve, that's mm -hmm. what you were doing. So just yeah, and, and I do leg. it, there's a very, for me, there's like a range right in here, just this much and back that avoids the click. If I go any further, then I get the click. Um, so, yeah. But the resistance is, um, into the hand, not away, and, or that from away coming up. So you're actually act. She's actually activating her psoas. So and then I stretch it afterward. <laughs> and then you stretch it after. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So and and if we follow on that track, so muscles can be short and weak, right? They just because they're shortened and tight doesn't mean that they're strong or overstrong. Sometimes they are short and weak, and that would fall into that category of a shortened, weakened muscle. And sometimes because they're weak, they shorten and grab. So that would be sort of a protective mechanism for a weak muscle would be to shorten and hold tight. Right? And that that's, can be a spasming kind of response. So if it is so as causing the click, then that te Genevieve's technique may well work. Yeah. Any other ideas, or even on a different branch of hip? Coming. Um, and then the other thing with, about the hip is there can be a lot of pain with the bursa. Is it, isn't that correct? That is or correct. Aching that can kind of confuses the whole thing. So, um, what? I what I, I think that I have that issue sometimes, so I just try to stretch, like figure four stretch, that kind of thing, and that seems to help. Okay. So what, can you talk more about that? Yes. Okay, so if we're going to differentiate between hip arthritis and bursitis, there are a couple really distinct ways we can do that. So hip osteoarthritis, um, Generally, the complaint of pain 
is, so I think what Kim's getting in similar is that both people will complain of stiffness and pain with walking or activities. So that would be the same. What will happen with osteoarthritis is the pain will get better as they walk, usually the right amount, right? Not overly. And with bursitis, it'll actually get worse the more they walk, not better. So that's one big differential that you could collect without even testing anybody just by speaking to them. The other thing that's pretty determinant is usually osteoarthritis pain is what you, the complaint you get is groin, more groin pain related. When it's bursitis, they, the pain is out here. So it hurts them to lay on their side with bursitis, um, whereas it hurt the pain, it kind of comes into the groin or they think they have an adductor strain or a psoas strain if it's hip osteoarthritis. So that, those would be the main thing. And for those of you who don't know what bursitis really is, there are, bursa is a fluid filled sac in, and we have them scattered throughout our body. It's meant to create a little cushion, usually between a bony insertion point and a muscle tendon. So the hip bursitis, or this is actually trochanteric bursitis, which is out here. The greater trochanter of the femur, right, is the bone where it protrudes out. And um, we have a bursa there that prevents, because all those glute rotators, so the hip rotators, actually I'll stand up so I can show you, the hip rotators, so that would be motions going this way, all insert into this greater trochanter. And if you're not sure or you want to know if it's somebody's greater trochanter, you can feel the side of their leg and then either standing or lying down, you could do it, and then have them turn the foot out and back and out, and you'll feel the greater trochanter. I can feel mine right here, right? As I roll my foot out and in, I can actually feel where that greater trochanter is. And, and if you poke at your own greater trochanter, you're gonna go, ooh, it's kind of sore there. It's always kind of a sensitive spot. Just so much is going on there. But it will be, they'll be like, ooh, that really hurts when you poke there, once you get to that greater trochanter, if it's a bursitis at the greater trochanter. So that's, um, that would be a great way to see if, you, if you're not sure what's going on at their hip and you're suspecting that their comments are, it hurts more when I walk, um, it, it keeps me up at night, I can't lay on my side, and you're thinking, is that, what is that? Could that be a bursitis? You could just poke their side of their hip, find their greater trochanter, poke it and go, is that where it hurts? Oh yeah, that's totally it. Or, no, it's kind of sore there, but not really. You can poke the other side. Oh, it's about the same on both sides. So you know, probably not. A bursa, inflamed bursa is sore. It's really sore to touch or to lay on. So, um, so I would, that's kind of how I would differentiate that. And, and then the treatment is actually pretty different because Kim was saying, what if I stretch? So figure four stretch, why would that work for a bursitis? right? Because the muscles are attaching right there. So if we loosen up these tight muscles that attach on that greater trochanter, there's less pull on that spot. So less pressure on the bursa. So the figure four stretch should be helpful for people who have a bursitis. The other thing that is super helpful is teaching them how to stand up straight and how to walk. Because chances are when they get tired walking, their hips are doing a little runway model hip walk, right? So if the hip goes out to the side, it puts more pressure on the outer part of the leg and more pressure on the bursa, right? So this kind of walking or standing, people who stand like this, or you know who else ends up like this are mothers carrying children on one side and they end up with bursa bursitis on the other side. But that's a great group of people that you'll see this with, or people who just have uh, not very good posture, right? So they end up standing on one leg or they end up walking. So standing up tall, teaching them to stand up tall with their hip underneath them, stretching out those glutes um, and walking up tall, not walking down here lazy, right? Walking up tall. So they're getting only the right amount of lateral motion, but not excessive motion will really help take pressure off 
the bursa. I, I also often recommend that people use, if they're hiking, using hiking poles, because that's a great way to keep the posture upright, especially as they get tired and they get more heel weighted and back here, they're gonna put more pressure on those. But that could also be good for someone with a hip osteoarthritis would be also, the poles would be a great way to um, decrease pressure there too. Does that help, Kim? Yes, yes it does, yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions on bursitis, hip, uh, so this would be trochanteric bursitis we're talking about. All right, any other um, hip questions, more specific hip questions? Okay, so then I would say in general, somebody with a hip dysfunction, what exercises would be great for those people? So I always come back to balance, right? Balancing the hip joint. So we want to strengthen and stretch and balance out the whole, the whole thing. So we are looking at adductors, hip rotators, glutes, hamstrings, right? So all of those, and quads. I almost forgot the quads, that would be bad. <laughs> so really getting that, all of them stretched and balanced and strengthened. Um, and I do a fair bit on the equipment with people with hips who feel hip compression because I want to unload, excuse me, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I want to unload their hips a lot. So I do do a lot on springboard with knees over the bar. I do a lot feet and springs, but usually my cueing with feet and springs is lengthening away from the body. So not having compression, but reaching away through the, through the spring. So if we're now in COVID time, I've been not been able to do a lot of that with a lot of people. So I've been using the roller a lot, like Allegro was saying, hips on the roller and TheraBand to give them something to push against. So if you like, I can take you through some of those exercises, some of my favorites and some of my favorite stretches for the hip. Yeah, okay. And then um, if you guys have time, I actually last Thursday, I did a stretch class. It was about a 50 minute stretch class um, focused on opening the hip. And one of my clients who was in it who really has hip issues and she said it was great. So if you wanna look back on uh, last Thursday, a week ago, so today is the what's today, 6th, so the 31st of July. If you wanna look back at the stretch class you, and to find more about hip, hip opening, then that might be a good adjunct to this session as well. And you can find that directly on our website in our online library. So if you grab a roller and you grab a TheraBand, So the hips on the roller, I think just helps so that you don't have to worry so much that they're having enough strength um, in their core in order to do the exercises. So I think sometimes it's really hard to, you wanna focus on something, but then as soon as you get into that position, they're not strong enough to hold it. So you back off and have to work on the abs instead of the hips, for example. So this sort of takes that away from our focus. So we can support them by having them here, uh, bringing the legs up to tabletop, and then I have to kind of wiggle myself in the right place here. Then I usually just start with a little, getting them rounded in here, rib cage pulling together, shoulder blades wide. Right, and then with the band, we can actually do a lot of sort of the foot in, foot in strap work. So that's what I use this for. I love the feet in the springs for these hip situations because I feel like it really helps get things aligned better and freed up. So this would be in order to sort of lubricate the joint and also get the muscles working. So here I'm in a little turnout in my band and I'll just press and bend again and press. So this is our frog and I'm sorry, I'm really slippery today. My clothes are really slippery. <laughs> All right, so press and bend and press. So I could use 
frog, which is usually very comfortable for them. And again, if they're getting that clicking or popping, you would just change the angle of the leg. So I, I could go down lower, challenge the abs more. But since our focus is more on the hips, I wouldn't worry about the challenge as much as I'm now worried about the motion. You could add resistance by pulling tighter and having them work harder for that if your goal was that more strengthening through the legs too, which is a big part of healing the hip. Great, and then coming on in, I'll take the feet, keeping them straight out, and then I can go down and up. And so the value, sorry, I'm sliding again, of this is the um, hamstrings get their good stretch on. So I can really feel the stretch on my way up and I can allow that motion. And my cueing is usually to stay really long through the legs. So reach away as I go, reaching away. Good, reaching away and reaching away. Great, and then one leg, I put one leg in. A lot of times I'll start with this bent leg. Allow for now this leg to just be down on the mat like this. So here I'm having this bottom hip actually stretch open a bit. And this, because the leg is bent, I'm getting more of a quad stretch than I would um, if my leg was straight. So it's, a great, it's great to do both. And here I can still keep this leg down and then work on the hamstring opening on this side. So reaching up and bending down. Reaching up and bending down. Reaching up, bending in. Reaching up and bending in. I really love this as a hamstring opener. So I've been using it a lot. And then you can change the angle. So bringing the thigh more towards the body and trying to stretch it open and bend it in and open and bend it in. The other value of having the hips on the roller is that the pelvis can stay really stable here. Open and bending in and open. Great. So then opening that leg and taking it down by itself and back up. So now I'm parallel down, I'm reaching away and bringing it up, reaching away and bring it up and reaching away and bring it up and then circling. So you can circle here around and up and I'm trying to keep lengthening away as I go around. So I still feel that I, I, it's almost like I'm trying to pull the leg out of its socket as it goes round and then reversing and reversing. Right, so I can make these really nice big circles. Then I could hold it. So depending on the length of their hamstrings, you might want them to bend the knee to get a stretch at the hip, or you can have them stretch out the leg, right, straight out. So if they can't, I'm pretty open in my bottom hip, so I could do it with a straight leg, but if not, have them bend. So you can focus on opening this bottom leg, right? Belly's pulling in. And then if they have more range, you can take the leg up and try and straighten that top leg too. And then we can hold here and let that stretch happen. If you, the other place where I think it's really helpful to stretch so is the glute here and the lateral side of the leg, the IT band, so that would be the lateral side. I can get a really nice stretch here by taking this across. And you could decide if you wanted to stay with just this as a stretch, or you could even take it, I often take it way over the side like that and get the stretch all the way up through the lateral side of the leg. And as I sit here, gravity kind of does its work for me, opening that up. And then bring it back up. And usually here, I'll take the band off for a minute, take both legs up and open out to the center. So I get that center stretch as well. So this would be sort of the stretching. We'll go ahead and do the other side. 
So we've already done frog on both, so I'll just start with the band on this leg. The bottom leg down to help open that quad. And then I'm gonna bend and press this top leg and press. Right, and press. And press to straight leg and press. And then I can again bring it closer to my chest. Instead of pressing up or trying to straighten the knee overhead and bend, press, and bend. Oh, my hamstring is so tight. And bend, and press. Bend, and press, and bend. Good, holding that leg there, taking the leg straight up and driving it down nice and long and back up, driving it down and down, reaching away, and reaching away. Good, really stretch it long, and down, and then down, and then you can take it into the circles. Starting small, I usually tell people to start really small and then work their way into a bigger circle, and really work that up and down motion as they go. And then reversing that direction. Good. And then holding there, you could take it across. Right? And even, uh, I'm sorry, I did the wrong order, but sliding across all the way if they felt like they had room to get this glute and lateral leg on stretch. And then bringing it back up, we can open down this leg. Um, and again, you could choose to bend that knee in so that the bottom leg can really open up. Or stretch it up to the sky. and then relax it in. So that is a really nice, or you could go back to the center if you wanted that balance at the end of it all. But that is a really nice uh, way to get those hips going. If you wanted to work um, without the band, you could also add kind of the leg circles, really strong legs coming around. Yeah, and the reverse, these I really have enjoyed kind of picking up speed with them, trying to hold stable. But after that work, the hips feel really free in those directions, I find. Um, and then there's one other, so uh, we could also do the figure four stretch here that Kim was talking about. So foot flexed, pressing in and letting that hip rotate open. Right, so that's just a great rotator stretch. and then um, switching to the other side. And I usually have them hold for a good 45 seconds to a minute, and I tell them at home that they should just hang out in these positions, letting their bodies open up. Great, and then relax. You then, yeah. Any thoughts, additions, comments on those? Yeah, go Allison. So um, I uh, have I found that I've been doing a lot of uh, hip hiking with uh, some of my clients. Um, one thing that I've noticed, especially um, with some of the women, is that they don't use their glutes at all. They don't even know how to fire their glutes. So for some reason, there's just a complete disconnect. Everything's interior, particularly walking. So like getting them to use their glutes when they're walking, 
um, and just to, to be able to connect to the glutes um, are is something that you kind of, I guess, lose over time and trying to get that back is really hard for some people. So, um, but not being in the studio and able to, um, you know, like be on the reformer lying on the side, I found that sometimes it's hard for them to, to feel what they want to, they need to feel there. So um, I've been doing for the ones at home, like standing on a yoga block and doing hic hiking, but standing instead to get them to find that position, lifting and lowering the hip. Um, but one of my favorites to do in the studio, um, and I feel like it's better than doing uh, lying on their side um, on the reformer, is actually on the chair. You put a box next to the chair and then line their feet yeah. up so that one foot's on the chair and one foot's on the box. And then it's really, they really have to feel, especially if you have them on a lighter spring, how to transfer their weight to be able to stay balanced and really feel that the, even the tiniest hip movement. Yeah. I don't know if you want me to demonstrate that or. Yeah, I love that exercise. Actually, I kind of uh, don't use it enough, that hip hike on the box. I just would, with hip hike, you want to make a determination or a, a division between QL working and glute medius working on the stance leg. So it would either be glute medius on the stance leg doing the, so if I, um, if I, stand on my right leg mm -hmm. and squeeze that glute in and that brings up my left hip. It's my glute medius on the right doing the work. Right. Where if I stand on my left and I hike my left, my, sorry, stand on my right and I hike my left hip, now I'm using QL to do it. So can you get both to work at the same time? Sure you can. And I think that's what happens on the chair because one leg is standing and one leg is moving. Um, right. At home on the box, I think a lot of people just end up doing this. Exactly, yeah. So the glute meat isn't getting as much. In that case, it, was, it would be in sideline unless you can. I, I took people off the box when I want them to find glute medius actually, and I tell them stand up tall enough, keep your hips level, but stand up tall enough that one foot just floats because that's now stance like glute medius, but I'm pretty level, I'm, it's not exactly level, but I'm pretty level still across my hips when I do that. Right. Instead of hip hiked. Right. Right, so I would just say that would be my one comment on the hip hiking is to decide what it is you're working. Some people absolutely need QL work and they need that hip hike on the moving leg. But m the older ladies mostly need glute medius, in my opinion. So getting yeah. them into glute med is the key, um, rather than QL. And one, right. so, one, go ahead. Sorry, I will just, I'll have them touch, like actually palpate themselves back here okay. to make sure that they actually feel it tighten when they lift. Because yeah. if that's not happening, then you know you could definitely up and down and never feel anything back here but if you have them make them squeeze and then they're squeezing the entire glute as well to get that to fire sometimes too which is yeah better <laughs> so yeah okay it's something and then the other reason why i think these elderly I and mean, picking on elderly ladies have a hard time getting into their glutes is because their posture is here and so they're so tight in the front of the hip that they cannot access the back of the hip. And they end up, I call it the marching walk, walking yeah. around like this, right? You recognize this walk. If I put a walker in front of me, it'd look really, <laughs> right? You've seen it, right? Well, but, and it's because of their, they want to watch the ground when they're walking. They don't want to look ahead. They want to make sure they don't trip on anything. So it's a little bit of fear that's happening there as well. It, you're right. Absolutely. It's so many things that make them go that way, but their, their balance is worse if they're here than if they're here. So they're actually more likely to fall if they're looking down. So then that over time gets these so tight that it's really hard to access posterior chain. 
if so you can imagine that with a bicep it's really easy to picture a, a bicep if a bicep's too tight you've seen those guys who walk around their arms are like this when they're walking around their arms never go straight unless they like it's work for them to get straight because the biceps are so tight the triceps can't fire right so there's not a balance anymore between the two muscles so that can happen hip flexors so tight glutes can't engage or even quads can do that too quads can get so tight that posterior chain hamstrings glutes can't engage so that's something to work on too i would spend a lot of time stretching open if you're going to be working glutes so that you can actually they can actually access their glutes so stretching so as stretching long quads so rectus femoris more most specifically yeah and um, to get to glutes jen yeah um actually allison can you just show the one that you were talking about with the chair in the box i'm not sure i'm i'm following You're still muted, Allison, too. Could you unmute yourself? <laughs> Help. <laughs> no, yeah, I think so. <laughs> OK, so can everyone see? Yes. Here, OK, so you put the, the box next to the chair. And then um, make sure that you can get the pedal all the way down. So you might need to adjust it a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to put this on like, a, like the second from the top. Um, anyway, so then you'll have them stand and bring one foot onto uh, the pedal. The other foot stays on the chair. Have them line your, their feet up to do this. And then they can stay here and they could do hip hikes and they really have to use their glutes here in order to move up and down. You can also have them bend the knee to, to try to get them to stabilize their um, hips because it's really hard to, for a lot of people, it's hard to get them to understand holding both sides of the pelvis even all of the time. So uh, the whole series would be, you know, keeping the hips completely even as you bend and straighten and both sides you can do that, but you can also keep the legs straight and do the hip hikes here where you have to press up with the outside of this, um, this glute here. And then also taking their hands off of the handle and working balance as well. Cool. Thank you. Sounds great. Yeah, I've done it with the moon box instead of the other, the big box. Okay. I don't know if you've done it both ways. Maybe the big box is more stable. I, I think it's because um, I used to do this with like a group class. So I think the, um, the larger box is more stable. It gives them more space to work with so they don't feel like, but it's further from the ground. So it's yeah. like straight off. But um, it's, it's worked and it's, uh, people hate it, so it must be effective. Because <laughs> 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 that's the, uh, yeah, that's how you know if you're getting your clients engaged, right? Exactly. Yeah. Great. Um, um, I have a quick question going back to the, the hip stuff that you were doing. Um, the, this always has, um, I guess, I wonder about it. Like in frog, I feel like some people have the tendency that they really, really want to go super wide with their knees when their legs are in. And I mean, I've tried to say it 500 different times, like, because I don't know, I just feel like one shouldn't be that rotate. So maybe their feet are too rotated. But like, then I'm thinking, well, 
maybe that's just the way their body naturally goes and like I shouldn't be fighting or just trying to get, but I feel like that I'm trying to get them more inward, you know, it's like less of a stretch, more work, you know, cause I like, they're probably not getting into their hamstrings as much as they need to be um, to really feel that. So I don't know, any thoughts on that? Yes, I have lots of thoughts about that. <laughs> so people are gonna go to the path of least resistance, right? So it's like th when they go really wide, it's easy. It's super easy to go wide when your feet are in the straps, if you're flexible, right? Because the legs more naturally want to go. Here, I can just kind of hang out. Here, I actually have to do some work. So I, the other thing is that the line of push is not going to be this way because I would then crash my feet together, right? So the line of press, you want it to be a heel connection. And I tell them, even though, so here, take, I usually take them out to straight legs, squeeze, and tell them you need to keep that integrity as you're coming down. So imagine that you're still squeezing together as your legs come down, and then press back. So not relax and collapse, but continue that, that feeling of squeezing as you're coming in. So my cue for that is imagine there's an elastic band where your stretchy pants are attached in between your knees so that as you come in, there's still a pull inward and then reach back out. And I've thought about putting a band around the, the legs, but that actually would make them want to push out. So it really would have to be as like attaching their pants together <laughs> in the middle. I've got my fingers holding my pants together and, and letting the knees bend in, but so that they still feel that elastic connection as they're bending in. So basically they're totally turning off their adductors and flopping their way in. That's my opinion about that. So I usually try and keep them two things, keep the adductors on and keep the line of pull of the knees with the feet, right? If I go so wide, then when I go to press, I'm gonna crash into my feet if I go really wide there, right? So it's not direct line. So then I have to do some sort of weird wrapping to come in together and I actually lost my turnout. Whereas if I just stay in turnout and keep that uh, connection in my inner thighs, then I can keep that same line of press throughout. I'm not rolling out and then pressing in. Anyone else have an idea about that? No. All right. I'll, yeah. I'll just say that um, I I also notice a lot of times when people are doing frog, when they're pulling back in, they'll tuck their pelvis and lift the tailbone. Yes. So, like cueing them to, you know, put, kind of press forward to try to stay in neutral and keep the tailbone down. A lot of times we'll correct that as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Because they can't really stay in that position, then it becomes uncomfortable. Whereas if they are tucked, they can get their legs all the way back and it feels like a great stretch, but then it's not work, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions about the hip? Um, <clears throat> lately, I've been working with people and getting their hips level in um, like a split stance, um, either in a lunge or um, I'll usually start them in kneeling and working on getting the glute medius on in that position. And so like, I'll, you know, kind of tell them to um, squeeze the, the stance glute and press the hip forward and then squeeze so much that the right hip, you know, the non-weighted hip lifts. And then from there, try to settle the hip down so that you bring this into a straight line. If you had a little waist, uh, you know, a colored band across your um, ASIS, that that would be a straight line. Um, mm -hmm. And then I talk about this leg and kind of spiraling the knee open. And I've been, I use this phrase a lot of like, 
wrapping your flesh around your sits bone back there. Um, and so those are just kind of the phrases and like cues I've been using. Um, I don't know if there's other ones that you guys can think of for split kneeling stance or, or lunging, but those ones I feel like when I think of those cues, they like really turn on all those, all those muscles. I, I agree. I like all your cues. And I got frustrated because I can't touch people to fix the problem right now. So my, um, what I'm making them do, which is really not very nice, but it, it seems to work. And I thought at first I'll throw this out to you guys. I would never tell this to my instructors. I have like, I have good size thighs. And so I, at first I thought, is it just because I have big thighs that I can actually keep the ball there? So are skinny legged people going to be able to? But I, I think it's not a leg size thing. So I think it doesn't work across the board. But I encourage you to try it on yourselves. And you can give me feedback on that. But I make them take the ball like way up in the crotch. And you could do it kneeling like Genevieve was, or you can do it lunging. I feel it a lot more in the lunge. So it's right up as high as I can get it. And then I have them stand here. So that same line you were talking about, Genevieve, is, is happening, right? My waistband line is right here. But in order to keep that line really straightforward, I have to push this thigh into the ball and pull this hip back. So now my line is straight and I'm, I've got a lot of pressure on that ball. Then I can do whatever I want from here, but I have to keep that pressure. So what I usually do is bend that front knee let the back leg stay totally uh, vertical, like so perpendicular to the floor. And then I can sit, if I sit that front hip back and that bottom leg stays totally vertical, I actually can keep the pressure on the ball in both directions. So front hip back, back hip front, and then I can come right back up. So then I, as they get more experience, you can actually deepen that lunge, but that pressure stays on the ball and then I have them, I have them where I want them. See, your balls are staying too. And so it's I not- I love that. <laughs> it's not just my big thighs. For a while I was like, is it just my big thighs that keep the ball there? No, okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I find that that really makes them hip crease back on the stance leg and release this back knee, but keep the pressure of that hip. So I end up keeping them straight. So that is my version of Genevieve's um, wrapping because I feel like then all the things sort of happen the way I want them to without my hands. That's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Works. Yeah, it works. It works on skinny. I know Allison has skinny legs. It works on Allison's skinny legs. So. <laughs> um, all right, you guys, uh, thank you so much for this. This is great. Do you have a topic, anyone, that you want to cover next time? Um, I was just thinking about um, the, the, I mean, maybe we already, I think we already went over this, though, but I was, just because I know we, we did, like, the, we did the shoulders and neck, didn't we? In this group? I'm not sure if we did in this group. Okay, well, I guess I was just thinking about that, like, posturally, you know, especially in um, poses, you know, to get the serratus, like the, the hundreds or like the double leg stretch where, you know, we have our arms up and how so much goes wrong there with just the arms and, you know, just, I guess maybe the whole, like, the whole, that whole, maybe just expanding on that, the, like the kind of that arm area connecting to that serratus and thoracic. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. When head is up. Yeah. Yeah. How, so basically how to roll up and take your arms up and not strain your neck, that sort of thing. Yeah. Like the, yeah. And the connection, like how important it is to, you know, kind of get the right placement, like, get, you know, try to turn your serratus on you know when when you're having the arms over head like that um so that's just my idea anyone else have any anything they want to add so i i actually would second that because i um i would add to that the ones who complain that their neck hurts 
um, mm -hmm. the, especially the front of their neck when they're doing these things and they don't, you know, um, want to keep their head lifted. You know, what's you, the peel back is obviously, you know, you, to support the head, but are there better ways to do that and what other exercises would help them strengthen their neck? Yeah, okay, I love that. Um, let's go with that. Uh, maybe I'll call it how to roll your head up or <laughs> keep your head on your shoulders. Yeah. Like come Allegra, up. could you come up with a good theme? <laughs> I, I'm all out of jingles today, but... Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe it'll be something like the keep your head on your shoulders, on your body, shoulders, whatever. I'll have Tits fix, finesse that for us. <laughs> I have one unrelated question and I'll throw this out to you and if you don't have an answer right now no big deal um, so I need to renew my uh, PMA certification and I had planned to go to the PMA conference to get all of my yes. exactly and that got canceled and so now it's due in like November and um, if you have any ideas for because there's nothing live anymore so and the website still says that you have to have a certain number in person versus live I don't know if they have changed that they've changed that requirement and okay. I'm not sure I can't remember they changed it allowing you to do virtual classes, I believe, okay. uh, or extending the date or both. So maybe just write in and ask them because I was supposed to speak at that conference. And yeah. when they canceled it, they said um, that people who need to, to re-up their PMA will either be able to use virtual classes or um, be able to extend the time in order to do it. So check on their website. Um, I was I, just on the website this week. It still hasn't been updated. So okay, that's then um, email. Uh, gosh, I know who the education chair is, and I'm not remembering her. I would email them now and just okay. say, "Hey, mine is expiring. Are my virtual classes going to be enough okay. this time around?" I, and I think the answer is yes. So, and then yeah. if you guys have any virtual classes to recommend. Um, or I can yeah. get these, then yeah, I would, uh, I'm all ears. <laughs> yeah, I do have quite a few to recommend. Okay. So I can write them up for you. And um, if you, you want to email me and I'll send you a list of good virtual classes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Well, I'll see you guys next week. Bye, guys. Bye. You. Bye. You're welcome. <laughs>